some person or, or some place is going to be where we find God. But God reveals himself to us by his spirit. And he reveals himself particularly in the word of God. This is not just a book, but it is the living word of God. And as we study the scriptures, God shows himself to us and we grow to know God. And this is why it is important to read, to preach, to listen to the word, to study the word, to let the word soak into us because it's by this that we come to know God. Amen? Amen. So let's pray and get into the word. Jesus, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you love us and we thank you that today you will show yourself to us in the scriptures. We thank you that we can leave here different than we came. And I ask that for each of us, you would embed your truth in our hearts, in our minds, that you would change us and make us more into your image. We praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever met someone who just could not take a hint? You ever know somebody like that? They're really thick. And often it's because, you know, you're trying to gently encourage them in one way, maybe out the door after the visit, or, you know, maybe you're trying to encourage them to do something, and they're like, what, what, no, everything's fine. Well, I had a roommate like this in my first year of Bible school. He was an emo. Do you know what an emo is? I don't know if they even have them anymore. He was a guy who wore eyeliner, let's put it that way. And he had some really crazy habits and crazy ideas. And one of the most annoying things about my roommate, who shall remain nameless to protect the innocent and the guilty, is he would stay up until all hours of the night listening to screaming music. I don't like screaming music, but he would listen to it on my computer, no less. This was so long ago that you couldn't just, you know, use your iPhone and your iPod and all that stuff. So he would use my big old computer to put his CDs in and listen to them on my thing <laughs> with the light on at four in the morning. So I decided to subtly send him a hint. I put curtains of blankets all up around my bed and I would make a point of saying, I'm going to bed now. And he would not listen. Nothing I could do could make him take a hint to save his life. I never did win on that one, but thankfully he was gone half the year on another mission, and so I didn't kill him. I figured that was a success for my first year of Bible school. But this world can be like this. It's a, it's a crazy place, and things that seem so obvious to us can be so hard for people to grasp. You look around the world and you see all the problems, all the struggles, all the issues that come in sin, and yet people don't seem to get a clue that, hey, if I try it again, it's not going to go better. You know, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And yet the entire history of the human race is of people saying, well, yeah, I know, I know they didn't get that right, but... I'm clearly better, so it'll work for me. And doing the same stupid things over and over again, even in the presence of full-on demonic activity. The world still shoves its head in the ground and tries to pretend as if nothing's happening, nothing's going on. That person over there is on the ground foaming at the mouth. I don't see anything. Everything's fine. Demanding that God bend to their will and do it their way. And the height of this in Jesus' day, the height of dense people who couldn't take a hint were the Pharisees. You know, we'd just been through all this period where the Pharisees are coming to Jesus, right? They've just seen him do a miracle. Not only that, but they know all the other things he's done, right? Raising the dead, feeding people, all these things that he's done how much he's proven himself, and yet they're still stubborn and denying him. They're still saying, show us a sign. Remember last time I preached, they asked, give us another sign after they just saw one. And he said, well, all you're getting is the sign of Jonah. They were not taking the hint. So today in our passage, we have Jesus finishing it off by hitting them really hard right between the eyes. So feel free to turn with me to Matthew 12, beginning in verse 43. What a good book, eh? Matthew, I tell you. Somebody knows how to name Bible books. Or maybe someone knows how to name Matthew's after Bible books, one of the two. 
But it begins in verse 43 with Jesus carrying on from where he had talked before and saying, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finding none. So then it says, I know, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds that that house is empty, swept, and everything is put in order. Then it goes and it brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So will it be with this evil generation. What a way to end off a conversation with the Pharisees. Hey, let me tell you about demons. And let me tell you about the situation for people who deal with demons. And there's three different ways that we need to see this text. The first one is Jesus is actually giving us a powerful insight into the demonic. Did you know, folks, the spiritual realm is real? Did you know the demonic is something that you have to deal with? Some of you guys have probably experienced it. I know I have. I think I've told you the story of being in dad's church and sitting in the back, and this dude walks in, and he was on, I don't know, everything but the kitchen sink. But all of a sudden, he starts talking in this weird other voice and trying to derail the service. And I didn't know what to do, but I could say, be quiet in Jesus' name. And guess what? He had to shut up. He could not talk. You could see he was trying his best, but he could not say a thing. Now, that doesn't mean he was delivered miraculously from the demon or anything because he was perfectly content to have that demon. But he did not have the power to do anything. I saw the demonic realm at work that day. I've seen it many times where it's not just that a person's bad, but that the devil has a hold over somebody. This is a real thing you'll have. And the first thing that we need to see here is some truths about the demonic realm. First, it is possible as an unbeliever to be possessed by demons, to be controlled by spiritual forces, to do things not because you want to, but because you've given your life over to something else so much that now it has control over your life. It's also important to see those demons can be cast out, right? We saw Jesus just finished casting a demon out of someone who had been made uh, deaf and mute by it, right? Deaf, mute, blind, mute. Blind and mute. I'm a great person for memory. And Jesus cast out the demon and they were cured. These demons had a power over this person because of the choices they'd made to allow the devil into their life. But Jesus has greater power and greater control. He was able to cast them out. The next thing we want to see is that demons are malevolent forces working to destroy. You look at this passage and Jesus is talking about a demon and he's saying, this demon wanders around trying to find rest. Well, a demon's rest is not found in peace and in sitting out in the sunshine and green grass with a cup of lemonade enjoying life as it passes by. A demon's whole goal in life is to take as many people with him as he can to a damnation that is sure. Demons aren't your friends. You know, there's some people that get into witchcraft or into all sorts of crazy things, and the principle is we can gain power. You know, the devil even came to Jesus in his temptation in the wilderness and said, I will give you all of this if you just bow down and worship me. And for some, that seems really enticing. If I give myself over to this demonic force, I'll get things in return. There's a story, have you ever heard that story about the monkey's paw? It's an old tale. It's about a guy who gets this magical monkey's paw. And he buys it in this weird curiosity shop. And the owner of the shop says, yes, each of these fingers on the paw is worth one wish. But I warn you, you shouldn't take it because each wish also comes with pain. Well, of course, he hears wishes and carries on anyway. And every wish he makes, you know, he wishes for wealth. Well, he gets wealth but in exchange, he leads to the sorrow and suffering of many people. And then he gets, you know, the wife that he was hoping for, but then she dies right away, on and on, all the way through. It never works out the way he hoped. And this is what happens when we turn to anything other than God as the answer in our life. It may seem really nice. We may have all this hope. Yes, if I just do this, it's going to solve my problems. But in the end, everything leads to death. It actually says in the scriptures, there's pleasure in sin for a season. There's things that can have a certain transient pleasure about them. 
in the world, but it says in the end it leads to death. And this is what happens when we deal with the demonic. It, they are malevolent forces that try to destroy us. And in this story, we hear about someone who has the demon cast out, but then after a while, it wanders on back and says, I think I'll look into where I was. They're not content to run away or to stay away just because they've been kicked out. They will try to come back. In a way, it's like trying to keep all of those puppies out of, out of my door. If I go and I open the back door, the puppies all rush and they try to get in. And I can kind of push one out over here and push one out over there. But while I'm doing it, the rest are coming right back. And you just can't stem the tide of puppies trying to get through the door. <coughs> just because you pushed them back once doesn't mean they say, Oh, well, I lost. I guess I'll go away. And this is how it is with the devil. The devil is very persistent. He is out to steal to kill, and to destroy. And he is single-minded in that. He is out to get you. Don't be fooled. He hates you. Now, before you all get worried and think that, you know, you have to hide behind something and duck down, we don't have to worry about the devil when we're walking with Christ, right? The devil is not powerful. Did you know that? The devil is not this demigod who is another opposite god to god and they're in this cosmic struggle in this wrestling that we don't know who's going to win, what's going to happen, the, the great fight against good and evil. We see the power of the devil in Revelation 20. I think I was talking about it with you guys a couple weeks ago, right? When the day comes where the devil needs to be bound up and thrown in prison, guess who does it? Oh, an archangel it must be like Gabriel or something. Or maybe even Jesus himself has to have a cosmic wrestling match with the devil, right? No. It's a random angel. God hands him a chain and hands him the keys and says, go throw that devil in prison. And he goes and chains him up and tosses him in. Why? He has no power unless it's for God's purposes. He has no power unless the Lord says you can go this far and no further. So as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, do not live in fear. Do not live in a worry that somehow the devil might get control of some politician or conqueror or ruler or whatever, and that somehow the purpose of God can be overthrown, because God is in control of this world. He is the boss, and He is the authority over spiritual forces. At the same time, don't think that you have any power. I love that story of the seven sons of Sceva. Did I tell you guys that one? It's in Acts, right? These seven sons of Sceva, the sons of a priest, they're looking and they're watching what the apostles are doing. They're saying, you know, we could do that too. They're casting out demons. Well, we could cast out demons. So they gather around this demon-possessed guy and they say, in the name of this Jesus Christ that Paul preaches, I cast you out. And the demon turns to them and says, well, Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who the heck are you? And he beats them up and kicks them out and they run out of the house naked. Because they thought that somehow they had power over the devil in their own strength or in their own power. That somehow they could just use some incantation. Oh, if I use the word Jesus as this magical uh, talisman, then somehow I'll be able to have power. That's not how it works. You have to know God and God has all authority and power. The devil will not be content to hold his own, but he will try harder. Just like in this story, if the devil comes back and he sees the house is empty, he's not just going to say, well, okay, I'll go back in. He's going to grab seven more friends and say, woohoo, we got another one, boys. And it's going to be messy. That's how that guy ended up in the tombs with a legion of demons, was because they just all piled on in there for more fun. The devil will do his best to destroy and to damage. It's not enough to empty the life of the demonic forces, to get back to neutral. But a life must be filled with something else. Jesus says, yeah, the de demon comes back and he looks and he says, wow, this, this life is pretty swanky now. Look at it. It's all clean and shiny. It's been swept and made nice. I think I'll bring my friends and we'll have a party. The absence of of something is not enough to keep the devil at bay. But we must be filled with something. We must be filled with the Spirit of God. As, as human beings, we are spiritual beings and we are controlled by one of two things, the scriptures say. We are either slaves to sin 
or we are slaves to righteousness. But there's never a time when we get to just be our own boss in our own right because we will always come under the sway of one or the other spirits in our life. So for Christians, there is a difference, right? An unbeliever can be possessed, but a Christian, we're already possessed. We're filled with the Spirit. Even when we're stupid, even when we're sinful, the devil can't just jackhammer Jesus out of the way and then climb on inside and start trying to do things. But the devil can have control in our lives too. How is that? Shane, I need you for a second. <laughs> All right, I want you to hold on to me as tight as you can. Okay, don't let go. <laughs> now, let go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that is how the devil can have control in the life of a Christian. If we grab on and don't let go to sin, if we grab on and don't get let go of lies, of problems, of things that are not of God, he can jerk us around just like I was jerking chain around. But if we let go, if we walk with God, if we surrender to him, the devil can be over there doing a really weird dance, but he has no power in our lives. Oof, that was more work than I wanted to do. You're too strong, Shane. This is important to see because for many of us, we can develop a fear of the devil. We can think that somehow, despite our best efforts to walk with God, he's going to jump out from behind a bush and grab us. He has no power to hold on to us unless we're holding on to him in sin. So when you're looking and you're saying, man, life doesn't seem like it's right. One of the things we can do is say, what am I believing that's not true? Maybe I'm thinking about myself that I'm no good. A lot of people that do that, right? Maybe I'm listening to voices that say, I need to fear, I need to doubt, I need to be full of anxiety. What if the world is not like it says in the Bible? What if God's not in control? What if everything's wrong? Well, then the devil can grab hold of us really good. Why? We've got onto him and we're listening to what he says. Give it up and turn to Christ and you will be free. If the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. Not free maybe, not free perhaps, not free someday. But spiritual forces have no power where we walk with Jesus. Do you hear me? Yes. Amen. The last state of the person will be worse than the first if we don't have the Spirit controlling our life. So, the first thing to see here is that the demonic is real, that people need to be delivered, and that they need something in their life to replace the demons. But this story is kind of like one of those Russian nesting dolls. There's a a thought within a thought within a thought here. And the next piece is about Jesus. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who've been denying who he is. Though he's proven himself and condemned their refusal to believe, they continue to be stupid. And so now he shows that they can be free but that even if he freed them from their sin, from their struggle, from their burden, because they won't turn to him, they're not going to be any better off. There's a lot of people in this world that seek a lot of ways to find freedom. Maybe they try new age, spirituality. Maybe they try wealth, power, all these different things. And what they want is the absence of the problem. And that's where the Pharisees were. They wanted the Romans gone. They wanted the control over their people. They wanted spiritual power and authority. They were willing to have the absence of the bad. But when God came to them and revealed himself to them in Christ, they were unwilling to take on God. Absence of bad, absence of problems, easy life is not the goal of our existence. Did you know that? The goal of humanity is not to be comfortable and safe, but to know God, to glorify Him, and to enjoy Him forever. If all we seek is freedom from problems, then all we get is that problem wandering off for a while and then coming back and finding seven more. 
It's why we have so many crazy things that happen in this world, you know. People look and they say, oh, I'm having struggles in my marriage. What am I going to do? I know. I'll just ditch her and get a new model. That'll fix everything, right? And guess what? It never works easily. You end up with twice as many problems. Maybe you think, oh, I'm having issues with some family member. I know. I'll just pretend they don't exist and then the problems will go away. That never works either. Maybe it's with your job. I'll just quit my job and find one where everyone's perfect. Maybe it's with your church. That's church. It's full of losers. I know. I'll go find a perfect church. And then you go to that one and it turns out there's a, at least one loser in that church too. Why? Because wherever we go, there's a sinner, right? It's hilarious. I, my, my uncle had a bumper sticker that said, Try Alberta lamb. 50,000 coyotes can't be wrong. <laughs> and I often think about that in, in relationship to these type of things. You know, when we look and we see all these 50,000 problems in, my, in our life, it never occurs to us that maybe we're the lamb <laughs> and they've all been coming to the same source every time. Maybe it's us that causes the problem. We always look and we think it must be someone else. And if we could just X, Y, or Z, get more money, get more friendship, get more power, get less of this, get less of that, the problem will disappear. And sometimes we do. We get that problem to go away by might and main, by force and power. But we always achieve seven more filling its place. It's like that story of the hydra. You know, he goes to defeat the hydra and he cuts its head off and two more pop out in the same spot. And over and over it happens. That's how our life is if we try to live neutral without God. We cannot do enough to be free because freedom is not just about removing death from us, but also about giving life in Christ. And this is why he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through him because it's no other path. There's no other way. Jesus in Gethsemane said, if there's another way, let's do that. And he still had to die because it's the only way to be free. And it was this that the Pharisees could not gas, grasp. They wanted the Messiah. They wanted the freedom of the Romans. They wanted their life problems to be solved, but they could not deal with Jesus. Reminds me of Gulliver's Travels. How many of you guys have read the book Gulliver's Travels? Excellent. Good work. It's a great book. It's lots of fun. It's not just a kid's book, actually. It's a political satire, by the way. Jonathan Swift was a smart guy. And there's one of the tales that he tells of Gulliver's Travels where he's walking through this land and all of a sudden he sees this floating island above him. And they pick him up and they take him into the island and they're floating over this desolate and barren wasteland. And on this island are all these highly intellectual people who are so lost in thought that they have to have a servant following them around with an inflated bladder on a stick to whack them on the head and remind them to pay attention while you're talking to them. Or they just go off into flights of fancy. And these guys were so smart that they decided to make the perfect world. But as we know, before you can build something new, you have to demolish the old. So they went and they literally demolished their whole country. And then they realize something. When the country's demolished, you can't repair it. It's gone. It's done. And there's no building blocks left. So now they just floated around on this island trying to get enough food from below to survive. And this is what happens in our lives when we try to just live without God but good. You actually destroy anything that's worth anything in your life and you're not left with life but with death. You know, you see those people who try to be stoic. They try to be above it all. They separate themselves from emotion. They become nothing. I've just been reading Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. It's an interesting book. And one of the things they do is they have a drug. And anytime there's any problems, you just pop a little bit of the drug and everything's happy and fine. But guess what? They're not living in real happiness or joy. They've just created an absence of the problem for a time until the drug wears off. And this is the state that we live in as humans without Christ. And oftentimes the world we create becomes infinitely worse. As we try to fix one problem, we make many worse. That Tsarist Russia, I'm reading another book. I, I read too many books maybe. I'm reading another book about the, the transfer from Tsarist Russia to Communist Russia, that whole revolutionary period. R Tsarist Russia was awful. There was one guy who owned personally 3,000 
peasants. They were his. He owned them like slaves. People were bought and sold and treated terribly. There was enough grain there for everyone to have food, but the government couldn't be bothered to ship it to places, and so people were starving to death. The, the place was awful and run just for the luxury of the rich. So people decided to rebel and get something better. And along came these guys named the Bolsheviks, and they were like, we'll make a perfect world. We'll give you everything you want. Everyone will be equal. Everyone will have a house and all of that. And they got the Soviet Union. They got worse than what they'd planned for, what they'd bargained for. And that's what happens when humans try their best to live their best life apart from Christ. We're left with worse demons than before. So what is the answer? Here's the next layer. Christ showed people the answer all the way back. If we go back to 1125 and on. He said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus was not selling a mere absence of bad. He was not presenting merely the best life that you can possibly have. He was not a self-help guru who was coming to show you how to be all that you can be. Jesus was making a way to the Father. He was giving people a path of a life totally taken over by the good of God. The Pharisees were looking for a Messiah who could be controlled, who could be ruled, who could be bossed around, who could, they could demand things from, and he would respond. But Jesus came, talking about life in the Spirit, as God, who would not bend. Like C.S. Lewis said, he's not a tame lion that you can push around. He is the Lion of Judah, who roars and tells us which way to go. Jesus gives us a life that fills us and controls us by God himself, free from the pain of the sin and the flesh of this world as we follow him, but not free from burdens or problems. I was telling our Romans group about my picture of, of uh, the way that the new creation works. You know, the scriptures say to us that in Christ we become a new creation. The old person actually dies, and we're left with a brand new shiny us. And the old person is laying dead on the floor. And how do we see sin and stuff happen in our lives? Well, occasionally the devil comes along with the shock paddles. And he gets that dead body and he tries to revive it. And he gives it a zap. And that old body gives a jerk. And we do something sinful. We do something stupid. But that doesn't change the fact that we are a new creation. And that the old us has passed and is gone. This is the work that Christ does. He frees people from their old life and he gives them not merely a life cleansed of evil but filled with good so when we're experiencing in our life this sense that there is a piece of the old person still around have you ever had that happen or is it just me where you look and you say you know I'm walking with Jesus and yet I still struggle what's the answer maybe you didn't do it right maybe you got to pray again maybe you got to be baptized in holier water or maybe you've got to, maybe it's something that you do What's the answer? No, you have to turn to God. The reason why we still carry those pieces of our old life is because the ideas that we believe, the actions that we perform, are the things that we're still hanging on to from that life. He wants us to be free. He will not punish us. Did you know that? He will not smite us just because we don't do what we he thinks we should all the time, but rather his kindness leads us to repentance. His grace shows us the way to be free. He says to us, as he said to the woman caught in adultery, where are your condemners? I don't condemn you, so go and sin no more. His purpose is not to beat us down, but to raise us up out of the swamp that is the sinful life we were in. And as we trust him, we will find freedom. And where we're struggling, we have the right as children of God to go to him and just say, 
Dad, help, because I don't know what to do. I don't have an answer and I don't have a way to be free apart from you. Christ will free us and fill us with good. So when demons flee, we can be free. But life in Christ is the real key. In a world that looks for the silver bullet, the quick way out, a way to grow our own power and actualize ourselves, Christ calls us to a greater life, to one that is not merely an absence of evil, but a powerful, living, breathing walk with God. Jesus ends this passage by saying, so also will it be with this evil generation. If we choose stubbornly and stupidly to try to do it our way, he'll just give us the prize. He'll just give us what we deserve. He'll just show us over and over that it's really dumb to do. Why? Because he loves us enough. He's not going to let us have our cake and eat it too when it comes to sin. As a wicked and perverse generation, we will find all that we hope to get, but all that it takes is to turn to him, surrender to him, give up, ask him for his life, and he will give it to us. He's not the kind of God who says, well, you have to be this tall to ride. You have to be this good enough before I'll talk to you. You have to do enough in order to please me. He says, come all to me, or come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the Jesus that we serve. He doesn't take half measures. He doesn't take one foot in the world and one foot with Christ. He's not interested in being our butler. He wants our whole life. Are you ready? It's time to leave off preaching and get to meddling. I want to ask everybody here, are you filled with the Spirit? Are you walking with God? Have you surrendered your life to Him? Not are you doing things. I don't give a rat's patoot what you're doing. I don't care if you look really shiny on the outside. Because that's just like the Pharisees. They looked really good. He said they looked like whitewashed tombs. But inside they were full of dead men's bones. I want to know are you filled with the Spirit? Are you walking with God today? If you're not, boy, I tell you, it's the time. Why wait? Why let it go another day? Do you seek his life from your world? Are you laying aside every hope, dream, desire, and plan that is not of God? He really is not interested in being the booster shot for our life or being our Sunday friend. He wants all of us. To live the life of freedom promised in Christ, we must be filled with his spirit, his way. And when we do that, we will find the freedom for which we hope and pray. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that this is true. <clears throat> I thank you that all you ask is to believe, to surrender, to give up our lives and to take on yours. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling today, whether they're struggling to find you in the first place, to walk with you, to know you, to surrender their lives to you, or whether they're those of us who are battling with some sin issue, some way that we're holding on to the devil, I pray that you would free us, help us, change our lives and our hearts, that we may walk with you. I pray that we would know you and not be counted among that wicked and perverse generation who look God in the eye and said, no, I want him my way. We know that you are good, and we know that you love us, and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.